I want to thank her and Mike for all of the detailed things they're doing throughout the week as well as here on Sunday morning. We appreciate them so much. And uh, all of you for joining with us this morning and being part of the service today. We love all of you and appreciate you. Amen. We're believing God for a supernatural breakthrough. Amen. In all of our lives. Amen. That's what God does and he's good at it. Praise the Lord. And uh, before I get into uh, too much this morning, I do want to mention that uh, I had a call from uh, Tim Hatton yesterday. Most of y'all know Tim. Uh, good man of God. Great man. Uh, love. He opens the services always and does such a great job of helping us to uh, come into the presence of the Lord. And, but anyway, uh, Tim called yesterday and uh, many of you would know Gavin. Uh, he's come and visited the church several times with Tim and Leah. And his mother, Sarah, has contracted the uh, virus, uh, the COVID-19, and uh, Tim had asked for prayer for her, and I did pray, but I would like the church to pray in agreement for her healing and protection for Gavin and for all the family that they would not be uh, subject to this virus as, uh, and, and be delivered, amen, from any impact or effects of it. We want to believe for Sarah to be totally, completely healed in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's just agree together wherever you are right now. If you have needs, amen, just call them out before the Lord and we'll agree with you as we pray for Sarah. God knows every one of those needs. We don't necessarily have to verbalize them, but uh, God knows. And if we'll agree together right now, amen, there's victory for each and every one of us. Praise the Lord. So on behalf of Sarah, uh, on behalf of Sarah, we pray right now, Lord for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to fall upon her, Lord, that by your stripes, Jesus, she was healed. We declare that healing as accomplished and finished in Jesus' name. No weapon formed against us, amen, will prosper. We pray right now for Sarah for total and complete healing in Jesus' name and for Gavin and the rest of the family that none of the impact of this virus will touch them or affect them, amen. We just shelter under the blood of the Almighty, amen. That, that blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and that includes, he, that includes healing, amen, for sickness and disease. And we declare Sarah healed right now in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a praise for it. Thank you, Lord, for all of the needs that have been prayed for here this morning around the church family, Lord, those that are calling out to you right now. We believe that it is accomplished, that it is finished in Jesus' name. We just praise you for it right now, Lord. We just give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Thank God. Amen. We're, we serve a mighty God. Amen. Nothing is impossible with Him. Praise the Lord. So, thank God for that. Thank you, Jesus. Now, uh, I got a few things I'd like to share with you as well. And that is, first of all, the French and I don't get along real well. Amen. Uh, <laughs> praise the Lord. And in fact, French pancakes give me the crepes. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, this morning it was kind of foggy, and I wanted to take uh, pictures of the fog, and so I got up, but I missed my chance. I guess I could do it tomorrow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Raise the Lord. Ba boom, boom. I wish Jim were. Uh, we need uh, James here to kind of give me a drum roll every once in a while just to keep you all in the mood, praise the Lord. But, uh, you know, I, math was always an issue for me. I managed to get through it, but I, I, I took algebra, advanced algebra, a couple of times. Uh, in fact, I took it, uh, had to take it again in, in college. Um, it's always been a struggle uh, to a certain degree, but uh, you shouldn't ever be, nobody should be intimidated by advanced math. I've discovered it's easy as pie. Pie, 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 P-I, praise the Lord. And speaking of math, I learned this early on. Do not talk infinity with a mathematician. They'll go on about it forever. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, so I noticed the other day Sally seemed to be getting a little over uh, concerned about some of the situations in the world today. And uh, I said, come on, honey, just relax. Let it go. I mean, just don't worry about it. And she said, hey, they're, they're talking like it's apocalypse. And I said, apocalypse, schmacalypse. And she said, you can't even spell apocalypse. And I said, well, it's not like it's the end of the world. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, Sally's uh, enjoying this right now and, of course, praying 
for my lying spirit. Praise God. But anyway, thank the Lord. God bless you all again. Appreciate you being with us. And so we're going to go into the Word of God now. But before we uh, start with our first scripture, I just want to uh, say a, a couple of things, kind of set things up here a little bit. But, you know, I've talked about this a lot of times. This, the, the scripture, Jesus said, the words that I speak, or that would be these words that are written, are the words that he spoke. And he said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. So I want you to, I know we can get kind of weird and, and get out there in, into no man's land, but at the same time, we need to understand that when we read the Word of God, it's speaking spiritual truths to us, and it isn't necessarily just the things that you're seeing on the surface. This thing is filled with symbolism, types and shadows, parables. Jesus even taught in parables. The parable isn't what he was trying to teach us. It was the, the, the relationship of that parable to the truth of God's Word. And so he just used a parable to make it make more sense to people. Amen? And that's true with the types and the shadows. The problem is we end up making the types and the shadows and the parables the truth when all they're supposed to be doing is pointing us to the spiritual truth that's greater than whatever that uh, story or, or experience might have been. And so I know we're, uh, we're I, I believe we're in the last days. Now what that means, I don't know what the last days, how many days that is, how long that takes. I'm not worrying about it. Praise the Lord. We're all under the shelter of the Almighty. Uh, but at the same time, the scripture talks about uh, well, in the book of Revelation, for example, and I've taught about this in the past, and I know it, it ruffles some feathers and some people don't agree with me, and that's fine. I mean, it's, this is just what I believe, but I believe it uh, to be accurate with the Word of God. And so now that we uh, are seeing these situations as they are uh, in the world, a lot of people say, okay, well, it's the end of the world, you know, and, and uh, they're going to build the temple in Jerusalem, and then it's all going to be wrapped up, and we're out of here. Praise the Lord. But here, I would like to, to just, for your consideration... Amen. Search the scriptures. Be a Berean. Amen. And see if, uh, if what I'm saying doesn't uh, resonate. Amen. With the truth. Because I really believe that it does. Amen. So we are, uh, we are Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. He's, he talks about it in the comparison of Abraham and uh, Sarah and, I, and Isaac and, and so forth. And we are that Jerusalem. Amen. And we are the temple. Praise the Lord. Now that's, that's what the scripture is teaching us. I know we look at the book of Revelation and it sounds like all this stuff is going to be happening. All this stuff is going to take place. I'm telling you, there's a truth underlying that. And that's what I would really like to talk to you about today. And, you know, God says he makes the last things first. First things last. In other words, he's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He tells the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. So what we're seeing in Revelation is just a, ref a reflection of what God was doing in the very beginning. His plan hasn't ever changed. He's just had to use different people, amen, over the years to get us to come to a place of real faith in what God's word says. And that's what I would like to talk to you about this morning, amen, in my usual random disconnected way. Praise the Lord. So that's your job to... Connect the dots, hallelujah. But here we go. Let's start with uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Again, thank you all for being with us. We love you. Appreciate you. Amen. And believe that God's going to be doing miracles, amen, in your life. Amen. And we're going to see breakthroughs in so many areas, amen, in the coming days. Praise the Lord. What the enemy meant for evil, I guarantee you God will use it for good. Praise the Lord for every one of us. Hallelujah. So for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 and 17. Praise the Lord. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. All right. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Praise God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature... Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Praise God. So now 
if you go to the opening chapters of Genesis, it shows us what God's intention was, amen, in creation, amen. Eden, the Garden of Eden, was to be his dwelling place on earth, amen. God made us for himself, amen, as his images in the Garden Temple in Eden. Praise the Lord. Now, just stay with me. I know I'm, I'm mixing some what you might think are metaphors, but I'm telling you, these words are all interchangeable. Hallelujah. And so God's presence gives life and purpose in Eden, which is presented as a sanctuary, amen, and a place where God dwells, right? Look at, uh, for example, let's just look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 real quick. We know God's walking in the garden, right? This is normal activity for the Lord, right? And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. All right? So God's walking in the garden of Eden, right? And then reaches out because Adam and Eve, it didn't work with Adam and Eve, right? That was to be his dwelling place. That was to be his sanctuary on earth. Amen? But because of their failure... God had to then move past them, and he begins, and you look through the scriptures, then he starts reaching out to the patriarchs. Then he starts reaching out to the, the leaders, amen, the, the family leaders, and so forth, right? And he, look at this, for example, uh, Leviticus chapter 26, verses 11 and 12. Leviticus 26, 11 and 12. I just want to show the consistency here of what God is doing. God creates heaven and earth. He puts man in his image there, amen, to keep it, amen, to, to uh, watch over it, amen, so that God has a sanctuary on earth, amen, where he can interact with humanity. Praise the Lord. So he said, and I set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. Now this is after the, the garden, right? This is after the fall. But God's purpose is still the same. He's still looking for a sanctuary. He's still looking for a garden, amen, or a temple where he can interact with his creation, amen, with his images. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's look again here in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 14. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, right, a matter is established. So here's Deuteronomy 23 and verse 14. For the Lord thy God walketh in the midst of thy camp to deliver thee and to give up thine enemies before thee. Therefore shall thy camp be holy, that he see no unclean thing in thee, and turn away from thee. Now this is before Jesus, obviously, so there were rituals and so forth that they had to go through to, clear, to cleanse themselves. Why? Because God's temple has to be holy. It has to be pure. It has to be clean. Amen? And here's God walking there, and he's telling them what he's going to do with them and for them. One more here, just for the sake of... Uh, pushing this thing over the top. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 6. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 6. Just trying to establish a, a truth here. Praise the Lord. So in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 6, he says, Whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle. Praise the Lord. A sanctuary. All right? Now, that's the same way that the Lord walked in Eden. It's identical. Amen? Because Eden itself was a temple and the dwelling place of God. Praise the Lord. Now, let's quickly, let's go back here to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. We talked about this last week. I've mentioned it in different messages over time. But I just want to reestablish this in your thinking. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. And it says, For we are laborers together with God, his images. We are God's husbandry, God's building. Now those all translate, those words all translate to be the same. Amen. We are his garden where he planted, amen, the incorruptible seed, which is his word. Amen. That makes us his children, that creates us in his image. Amen. And we are a sanctuary. Right? And we read at the very beginning that we are the temple of God, that we are a temple. So we're the garden. We're the sanctuary. We're the temple. We are the dwelling place of God. Amen. Now this goes all the way back to, to the creation. God hasn't changed. 
His purpose is still the same. It's us that have made it about religion and all sorts of other do's and don'ts. When God had a purpose, and that purpose was to have images, his images here in the earth, to be in a sanctuary, a place where he could walk and interact with them, amen, and, and be a blessing to them, praise the Lord. And so that they could, by the way, enlarge the place of his tent. Amen. Increase his dwelling place. Praise God. All right, let's look quickly here at Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Praise the Lord. Our calling as children of God is so much more uh, powerful and influential and impacting than we have realized. And we need to understand that in these days especially, we need to rise up. We need to be what God has called us and declared us to be, amen, in order to have the impact in this earth that we're supposed to have, in order to spread, amen, God's habitation, His area of influence, where God is walking, where He's meeting and, and interacting with humanity, amen? So God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. That's, that's a virus, praise the Lord, creeping on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. Amen? Subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. That's a germ. That's anything that's moving on the earth we have dominion over. Now, that has not changed. Just because Adam failed didn't mean God's plan changed. It, mean, it just meant he had to find somebody else, praise the Lord, to do what it was his intention was from the very beginning. Amen. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 15. <clears throat> Genesis 2 and verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Amen? To keep it healthy and to keep it growing. Right? So Eden is a place of God's presence. Adam's role was to keep and guard and fill the earth with a reflection of God's glory. That's why he was created in his image. Adam being in the image of God, right? Right? So in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, the original purpose for the universe was limited to Eden. Are you with me? The whole purpose of this universe, or the cosmos, however you want to define it, amen, is for God's person, amen. It was, it was for God's dwelling place, for His, amen, uh, interaction with humanity, Amen. It was for His glory to be revealed. Hallelujah. But it was limited to Eden. It was limited to the garden at that point. Amen. And God makes, I, I was talking about this earlier, but God makes the last things first. Right? So God's intent is to expand the sanctuary of Eden until it filled the whole earth. Praise the Lord. That was His plan. That's still His plan. Now the garden was a temple or a dwelling place for God on earth. Amen. Adam and Eve were in that first temple in Eden. Praise the Lord. They were cast out of that temple because of sin. Praise God. And then there's the tabernacle of Moses, right? God's dwelling place on earth. And eventually Solomon's temple. Amen? And even Solomon recognized that it was inadequate, right? That it wasn't big enough would be another way of saying it. In fact, let's look at this in 1 Kings chapter 8 and verse 27. 1 Kings 8 and verse 27. This is the temple built by Solomon. So magnificent, so beautiful, so expensive, and yet so limited. Amen? Now the day, uh, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Yeah. He's asking, uh, he's asking a rhetorical question. Behold, the heaven and the heavens cannot contain him. Right? He needs, he wants, to, he wants to be in the earth because he needs to be everywhere because he's everything. He's everywhere, right? So heaven can't contain God. God's, God's got to have the earth as well. How much less this house that I've built? Amen? So, okay, there's the temple. Now we talked about him walking with the patriarchs, that being a, a sanctuary, 
Amen. And so then, then the tabernacle and Moses, and that's the sanctuary. We know the glory of God come fills a temple that couldn't even minister, right? And the same thing happens with the temple of Solomon or Solomon's temple. Now, that, those are types, right? And then Jesus' death and resurrection are a destruction and a raising of the temple. Praise the Lord. John 2, 19 and 21, or through 21. John 2, verses 19 through 21. Right? Jesus is the ultimate reality of this. Right? Of God having access to the earth. Of Him having a temple. Of Him having a uh, sanctuary. Praise the Lord. And so Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple. Now see, Jesus is talking, we know, we know he's talking symbolism, but he's talking about the truth. Praise the Lord. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years with this temple in the building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? They're still having problems getting past the natural stuff and to the spirit. Which is how we often read the book of Revelation. Is why we get all hung up on flying bugs the size of bolts wagons and, and all kinds of other weird stuff. Instead of seeing the spiritual truth that God's trying to bring through that. Amen. So wilt thou rear it up uh, and, and wilt thou then raise it up in three days? It took 46 years to build this thing. And you're going to tear it down and build it up in three days? And he spake, but he spake of the temple of his body. Jesus talking about the real temple. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So Jesus becomes what? The, he becomes the cornerstone of the new temple. Yes. Amen. I'm talking about the new temple. I'm not talking about something that's going to happen in, in physical Israel somewhere. Amen. With bricks and, and mortar. Amen. I'm talking about Jesus is that in time. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, temple. He is the cornerstone of the new temple. Amen. And Christians, you and I, are living stones. Being built into a dwelling place of God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I don't know, that excites me. That's what the Bible's teaching us. That isn't just some weird thought I've had. That's everything throughout the, the, the Word of God is telling us that. We are that. We are a sanctuary. We are a dwelling place. We are a garden for God. Amen. And through that declaration of the Word of God, the church grows. Amen. We are, we are this sanctuary. We are this place of God's dwelling. And we are that through decla declaring, amen, the word of God during the church age. That's our purpose. That's our reason for being here. Amen. Look at this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. See, it's really hard to be successful if you don't know what the mission is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Can I get an amen, Mike? I mean, you've been on some missions, right? If you don't know what the mission is, how are you going to know if you've done it? How are you going to know if you succeeded? How are you going to know how to do it, right? And the problem has been so much with the church and religion is we don't know what the mission is. we got a bunch of rules and regulations to follow, but we don't know what the end result's supposed to be. Praise the Lord. So now, therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ be himself being the chief cornerstone. Praise God. Amen. In whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2 Verses 4 through 10. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 10. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. To whom coming as a, unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, uh, excuse me, unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. 
and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, amen, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, in which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now let me just, just ask this question, just, uh, just logically thinking, okay? If Jesus is the church, or if he is the uh, temple, and we are living stones as a part of that temple, then what would be the point in building a physical structure in Israel? It would be contradicting everything that Jesus Christ has done. I mean, just, I mean, think about this for a minute. Why would God, who has told us that he's the end, he's the final, the ultimate sacrifice, why would he then want to build a physical building somewhere and start offering up sacrifices again? It's totally contradicting everything that God has done in Christ. I mean, does it, are you with me? I mean, it just doesn't, it, to me, it just doesn't, it's not rational thinking to think that all of a sudden, because they build a building in Israel, amen, that God's coming back? For what? Solomon built the most beautiful temple there was, and he said, this ain't going to work. It won't keep him. He's too much for this. The temple needs to be expanded. Amen? So, thank you for being patient. Amen. And don't write me. Don't text me about this. Just, you can have your own opinion. I'm all good with it. Praise the Lord. So, through the church, the glory and the presence of God fills the earth. Amen? Isn't that what happened in the temple? Isn't that what happened in the sanctuaries? He filled it to the point where it was overflowing. They couldn't do anything. It was so powerful. Well, that's God's intent for the entire earth. And it has been since Adam and Eve in the garden in the original sanctuary. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. So now let's look at this in Revelation chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Revelation 3, 12 and 13. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. First of all, let me ask you how you overcome. We are made overcomers by the blood of the, Lord, of the Lamb. Amen. By the word of our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. So anybody, whoever's doing this has become a temple or a pillar in the temple of God. Or just another way of saying we are living stones in this living church. Amen. And so God, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem. Not talking about the physical, natural, geographic location. We're talking about the spirit. Because the words that he speaks are spirit and their life. Amen. So the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven. Amen. From my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit says. Amen. To the churches. Chapter 22, still in Revelation now. Let's go to chapter 22 of Revelation, verses 1 through 5. So Revelation now 22, verses 1 through 5. For those of you taking notes, praise the Lord. And I know some are because they've told me they are. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's Revelation. Okay, he showed me a pure river of water. Now, keep this in mind now, because we've seen this over and over. So he shows you a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. What does that remind you of? Eden. The rivers break off into three, and they float out of the garden, right? And so in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Wow, that sounds familiar. Amen. Which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Praise the Lord. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light or of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Somebody ought to say, praise the Lord. That's us. Glory to God. Amen. So God's purpose... And God's design for his dwelling place from the very beginning of creation was what? To fill the entire heaven and earth. To fill everything, the whole cosmos, not just here, 
Not just there, but everything. Amen? And so in the temple, just think about it. Here's some, some more of this typology that he gives us over and over. In the temple, the Holy of Holies, right? That's behind the veil. That's where the Ark of the Covenant would sit. Amen? And in the, so in the temple, the Holy of Holies stood for the invisible heavenly dimension. Amen? In, in the temple, because this is all back and forth, right? So God is saying, okay, here's what the Holy of Holies actually is. The Holy of Holies represents the invisible heavenly dimension of the universe where God dwelt, or in heaven, as we would say, right? All right, the holy place, the next step out from the Holy of Holies, is the holy place, and it's represented by the visible heavens, right? That's what it's representing. It's the outer court, men could go out there. And they, it, was, it represented the visible heavens, what we can see. Right? All right? And then the outer court was a symbol of the visible earth. Praise the Lord. Land, sea, place of human habitation, in other words. So you come in to the outer court, that's man's realm. Right? That's, it represents humans on the earth. In, that you can see. The next step in is heavens, but it's still visible heavens. It's, it's the natural, what you can see. But you can't get into the Holy of Holies, right? Because it's invisible. What's in there you can't see, right? Now that's the typology, right? And all of that pointed to the future, amen, when God's presence in the Holy of Holies, amen, would break out and fill the visible heavens and the visible earth. Woo! Hallelujah. I'm, I'm feeling it. Praise the Lord. And that began with Christ, and it continues through the church, Christ's body. Praise the Lord. That was symbolism. But it symbolized God breaking out, amen, of the invisible realm into the visible realm. Praise the Lord. So how is God, how is His works uh, uh, establishing His dwelling place begun in the new creation? Right? So how, how has God's workings, amen, established His dwelling in the new creation? All right, let's look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. I don't think people have a clue as to the influence that God has given you in this earth. When He said, I'm creating you in my image, you are my children. Listen, He gave you an inheritance. Praise the Lord. He gave you an inheritance, and that inheritance is to release God into this earth for everybody to experience. Amen? But it has to be done by faith in the Word of God. So therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, right? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are spirit beings. All right? And all the things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, we are physically, you can see us. But because we have entered into this sanctuary, we now have influence in the invisible and the visible realm. Amen? The idea is to not be invisible, but to take our invisible influence and reveal it into the physical world. Just as God. Amen? Just as God was trying to do. So God speaks to the world through the church. Amen? We are His witness. And He reconciles the world to Himself through us. Amen? Paul calls it the work of the new creation. <laughs> yeah. Good thinking, Paul. Hallelujah. The temple is expanding to fill heaven and earth, visible and invisible. Amen. In order to be ministers of reconciliation or priests of God, which is what he tells us we are, kings and priests, the power of our witness grows from the power of God's word in us, just as it did in Jesus. Hallelujah. Adam and Eve did not remember God's word, did they? And they fell. And they failed to extend the boundaries of God's temple because of that. Amen. The dwelling place. In Eden, it didn't get any bigger. It didn't expand. It was just that little microcosm, amen, because they didn't remember the word of God. Look at Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Luke 3, 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, 
which was the son of Heli. Now, this is the beginning. He's, he's giving us a genealogy, right? And we're going to skip a lot of it because it's irrelevant. What's important, though, is in Luke chapter 3 and verse 38. Which was the son of Enos. We're still talking about Jesus. Which was the son of Seth. Which was the son of Adam. Which was the son of God. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Next two scriptures. It's Luke 4, verses 1 and 2. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. He's the child of God. We just read it. He gave us his genealogy, right? He's God's son. So, right after that, acknowledgement, he's being full of the Holy Ghost. He returns from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. Now, here, my point is this. When Jesus, the last Adam... The Son of God is tempted in the wilderness. Unlike Adam and unlike Israel before him, Jesus prevails by speaking God's word and being faithful to that word. Not just saying it, but believing it. Am I right? And the devil had to flee. Praise the Lord. Jesus succeeded where Adam failed. He succeeded where Israel failed because he remembered God's word. Hallelujah. John 1, 14. I think sometimes we just think, well, it's just a, you know, it's a three-step program to, you know, a new house or a new car or something else. No, this, this is how we're to live. This is how we're supposed to. This is the influence we've been given. Amen. And we've made it about everything but the one thing. Hallelujah. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. What, what was Jesus? He was expanding the temple. He got him out of the Holy of Holies, the invisible realm, and brought him out into the outer court, amen, uh, the holy place, and to the outer court, where he was visible, where he was physically, tangibly able to be experienced by people. Hallelujah. This invisible God. So the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Praise the Lord. So if Jesus, just think about the logic here. If Jesus, the Word made flesh and tabernacle of God's presence, quoted God's Word in order to resist temptation and deception from the devil, maybe we should try it. <laughs> Duh! Give me a break. Maybe that would be a good thing for us to practice. Praise the Lord. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Maybe we should do the same thing. And if we're going to expand God's presence, if we're going to move God's presence throughout, amen, the earth, then God's word has to have priority in our lives. We got to believe it. We got to be speaking it. We got to declare it, amen. But sadly, a large part of the church, like Adam and like Israel, don't use the word as a weapon. They use it as a religious exercise. We quote it. Amen. When we're in church or for whatever. But we don't use it as a weapon. It's the sword of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. No weapon formed against me will prosper. I'm using the word of God as a weapon. I'm not just quoting some scripture, some vague, you know, un, uh, un, uh, misunderstood uh, scripture. But I'm declaring the word of God. So we've got to be careful not to be lulled into a uh, spiritual complacency because of our status as God's dwelling place. Amen. We can be God's dwelling place, but it won't get any bigger than Eden. We've got, to, we've got to step beyond this and begin to declare the word of God. Remember what God said. Declare that word in order for Eden to expand. In order for God's sanctuary to, to grow until it fills the entire earth. Amen. Now remember, we are kings and priests, right? Look at this in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 6 through 9. And I find this interesting because this is the same chapter that Jesus is quoting in, uh, I think it's Mark 3 or 4, either Mark or Luke, I can't remember now. But anyway, where he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach. What, what was Jesus saying? He's saying, I see, 
I see I am a sanctuary, and I'm going to expand this sanctuary, amen, so that God can fill the entire earth. He saw something that the Jews, the religious people there, didn't see, and it made them so mad they wanted to kill him. Praise the Lord. But you shall be named the priest. This is prophetic, speaking of us, the body of Christ. You shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You will eat the riches of the Gentiles. That's the unbelievers. Amen. And in their glory shall you boast yourselves. For your shame you shall have double. And for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. Praise the Lord. For the Lord, for I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. That would be Jesus. Praise the Lord. And their seed shall be known among the unbelievers, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them that they are the seed which the Lord has blessed. Amen. They get to see God through His children. Hallelujah. Amen. Sometimes, you know, we know uh, our, uh, our authority. Amen. We know it in theory. But we fail to practice that authority in reality. As Christians, we are now identified with Jesus through the Spirit as part of the end time temple. Glory to God. Hallelujah. We walk in the light as He is in the light. Amen. Thy word is truth. The light, thy truth is light to my path, a lamp to my feet. Amen. We walk in the truth, in other words, the Word of God. Amen. It's just like, you know, plants cannot grow and flourish without adequate sunlight. And we cannot flourish without remaining in the light of God's Word. Amen. The light of God's Word and His tabernacling presence. In other words, consciousness. Praise the Lord. We cannot bear fruit unless we let our light shine into the shadows of religion, amen, and unbelief. The mark of true church is, is expanding witness, amen, to the, to the presence of God. So the, the mark of the true church is an expanding reality of God's presence or a witness to the truth of His reality, amen. And so uh, in, the, in the invisible temple, that's this. And it only happens as we stand and speak and act in agreement with the Word of God. Praise the Lord. That's why Jesus was a perfect, perfect example of the temple of God or the tabernacle of God. Everything that came out of His mouth was as though God was speaking Himself. Amen? And the kingdom advanced. Right? We saw the influence that it had in that first generation. Praise the Lord. We're not condemned, listen guys, we aren't condemned to lives east of Eden. Hallelujah, we haven't been kicked out. We have embraced, amen, Eden, the garden, hallelujah, the sanctuary of God. We have literally become that. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus or into the invisible realm, right? To make it visible, amen, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Praise the Lord. Now remember, a new and living way. Remember how he said that, uh, here's how I want this... I want the waters of the river of Eden to flow out to cause Eden to expand to, so that the garden can grow beyond the borders of Eden, so that it can expand until it fills the entire earth is what it was about. Amen? Because of that, the life-giving waters that flowed in Eden, this is what I'm saying, now flow in us. As believers. Amen. Look at John 7 verse 38. John 7 and 38. He that believeth on me, 
as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Or you could say, out of the sanctuary, we are the sanctuary, right? Out of the sanctuary, the river flows, amen, in order to increase the garden of God or to increase God's presence in the earth, amen? John 4, 13 and 14. John 4, 13 and 14. Praise the Lord. This will be the last scripture. We're wrapping her up. Praise the Lord. Jesus answered and said unto her, the woman at the well, the, the Samaritan, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Praise the Lord. So just like the river that flowed out of Eden to the lands that would later exist, being Assyria and Cush and all the others that would come as a result of that, others, just like all of the, the influence that that was supposed to have, we didn't just drink the water. Amen? We are wells of water. Amen? We are rivers of water that flow to the world through the Word of God. We are the new temple. We are the new Jerusalem. Let's quit looking somewhere else and start looking here. If we want to expand the temple, we've got to start believing the invisible. We've got to look at things that are not as though they are so that other people can see the results of faith in the Word of God. That expands the sanctuary. That expands the garden. Amen? And what happens? The incorruptible seed of God's Word influences another life and another life. And it grows and it grows. And the light of the truth of God's Word causes increase and influence everywhere it goes. Church, I'm telling you, I believe we're here to see this. And that's why I say when I talk about the miracles and the supernatural and the things that are going to happen and are, are happening now but will increase, it's because of our awareness. And these are the kinds of things that the devil means for evil to cause us to cower and draw back when in fact these are the kinds of things that should make us bold and flow out of the truth of God's Word and defeat that enemy and increase the glory of God in this earth because His glory will fill this earth. His presence will fill this earth before the Lord comes. Amen. And it ain't happening in some little geographic location in one spot. It's everywhere. There's temples everywhere. The, the, the uh, sanctuaries of God, amen, are here for one reason. For the expansion of His kingdom. Amen. For the expansion of the temple. For the, example, for the extension of His dwelling place. Amen. Know you not? You are the temple of God. Hallelujah. You, if you didn't know it, you know it now. Praise the Lord. Let's get, let's get excited. Let's get real about this. Let's quit freaking out about what the, the Gentiles are saying. And let's declare what God has said. And He'll give us double for our trouble, is what we just read a few minutes ago. Amen. I'm good with that. Y'all use a double up. Praise the Lord. Amen. The casinos are closed, but we can still win. Hallelujah. The odds are on our side. Glory to God. And it's not a roll of the dice. We know the outcome before it ever happens. Praise the Lord. We're, 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 you know, we're, we're able to uh, count cards. Hallelujah. Play poker. It, you know, blackjack, 21. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you all my gambling experience. I'm just saying we know the results. It's not a gamble for us. It's a sure thing. We just pick up the money at the counter and walk out. Hallelujah. We just pick up the victory. Praise the Lord. God is expanding His temple. Amen. And it's not a new thing. It's the thing that He started in the very beginning. And the end will prove it. Praise the Lord. He knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. Praise the Lord. And we get to see it. Praise the Lord. We get to experience it if we'll have the faith to declare His Word. God bless all of you. Think outside the box. I mean, God's not trapped in our human thinking. We need to think the way the Spirit thinks in order to get the benefits of the Spirit. Praise the Lord. Nothing is impossible to them that believe. And that's us. Praise the Lord. Believe. And you'll have it in Jesus' name. God bless you. You're dismissed. Hope to see you back here next week. Have a great week in Jesus. Take some territory. Praise God. In Jesus' name.